Good morning, everybody. I'm Father Chris Alar. We are here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, and it's a joy and honor to be with you. Uh, today, we have a special talk on continuing our Marian apparitions, but this is a very interesting one because we're going to be talking about Gara Bindal, and we've invited special guest Ted Flynn, well-known author. Um, he has a new book out called Gara Bindal. We'll talk about that and show you the information in a moment. But I just want to take a few minutes to mention this uh, apparition. And a lot of people are probably already starting your letter to the bishop complaining that I am even mentioning this word. Please hear us out. Uh, Gara Bindal, yes, it is true that the recent local bishops um, uh, from this diocese in Santander in Spain have stated, and I'll read you a quote from the, one of the recent ones, my position like that of my predecessors is that Rome's assessment remains valid. There are no signs of supernaturality. Okay, then Father, why are you talking about it? The church has condemned it. No, it hasn't. There are three levels of church approval, or I should say church assessment or church ruling on an apparition. Now, um, I had a big medical procedure yesterday. They had to cut out a bunch of polyps out of my colon. I've been bleeding. And so I did not get a chance to prepare slides. So I'm going to give you verbally, hopefully you can stay with me. Now, the first ruling of the church on an apparition can be one of three things. Constat de supernaturalitate means in the Latin that it is established to be supernatural. This is a case like Fatima, Lourdes, La Salette, Cabejo, Akita, uh, and many others. That means it is established to be supernatural. The second category is constat de non supernaturalitate, which means it is established not supernatural, which means it's condemned. An example would be Bayside of New York. So this is condemned. Now the third category of which Garabindal falls into is non-constat de supernatural alitate, which means it is not established as supernatural. Now there's a difference. The second category is established not supernatural, means it's condemned. This third category is it's not been established as either. It's not condemned, it's not approved. So we are allowed to discuss it. Are we Marian fathers promoting this as approved? Absolutely not. But the message here is important, why? Because one of the former bishops um, in a decree in July 8, 1965, says we've refused to recognize fully the supernatural character of these apparitions. However, in that same decree, he acknowledged the doctrinal integrity of Garabinda. Quote, this is the local bishop. We point out, however, that we have not found anything deserving of ecclesiastical censorship or condemnation either in the doctrine or in the spiritual recommendations that have been publicized as having been addressed to the faithful. For these contain an exhortation to prayer and sacrifice, to Eucharistic devotion, to veneration of Our Lady in traditional praiseworthy ways, and to holy fear of God offended by our sins. They simply repeat the common doctrine of the church in these matters. Okay, and so he said that the broader message of Garabindal involves an exhortation to the Marian prayer and the rosary. The Blessed Virgin even taught the children how to pray the rosary. And so it was the main message is the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of the priesthood. Major issues here. So that's why we're going to talk about it. Are we promoting it as approved? No, but it's not condemned contrary to what everybody says. It is non-constant. And so please keep that in mind. And so Ted is going to join us now. He's going to talk about the elements um, and very much, very important. The doctors and medical examinationers who reviewed these children said there's no psychological issues. This has been supported by Padre Pio, John Paul II, Mother Teresa, 
Mother Angelica, and many others. And so let us now join uh, Ted Flynn, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Garabindal. Thank you. Thank you. What an absolute pleasure to be here at what I call the mothership of divine mercy for North America. And we're going to be speaking today about Garabindal, which I call God's ultimate acts of mercy uh, for a wayward world and what we're going to be looking at. So here we are in the shrine, National Shrine of Mercy talking about mercy and, and what Garabindal is about. So uh, there is basically about 40, 35 minutes left here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk fast, so you're gonna have to listen fast. So we can kind of get over a lot of the material here and not leave too many things stranded. But on the other hand, the Blessed Mother appeared in Garabandal, Spain, northwestern Spain, right on the Bay of Biscay. Uh, and from 1961 to 1965, uh, to four young girls, 11 and 12, f um, over a four-year and four-month period where the Blessed Mother appeared a total of 2,000 times. Now, if you look at that body of appearances where the Blessed Mother spoke to the girls, there isn't really that many messages that were released to the world like you'd see maybe at other apparition sites where there have been many um, things said over that period of time. And so if you want, um, Garabindal is in the Diocese of Santander, Spain. Santander is a fairly large city. It's got actually one of the largest banks in all Spain, the Bank of Santander. And it's about, Garabindal is about 50 minutes <clears throat> from, um, from Santander driving. And if you want to take a look at what it was like in 1961, it was a village of 300 people. And at that time, there literally wasn't a motor in the village with a moving part. Now, if you want to take a look at the simplicity of that vis-a-vis -vis the United States or the West of the, what they were living like then, just eight years later in 1969, the United States sent men to the moon and brought them home safely. So there's a great differential there in culture and what times were like. So today is going to be a little bit of a cross between a PowerPoint presentation and cliff notes. So people who are old enough to know what cliff notes are, and, and the younger people listening won't. <clears throat> and as I say, it was over four years and four months, so that's a long period of time. So what were the prophecies principally about? <clears throat> As all authentic um, prophecies and apparitions in the world, they're very, very simple. They're very, very direct. It's the Blessed Mother always pointing to her son. And they were really about hope, trust, mercy, and love. Again, that's what Garabandal is about. That's what heaven was doing at that point. Because you could really look at apparitions like, frankly, love letters to humanity for a given point in time of exhortation. And then the principal messages, as always, was number one about amendment in, in, of life, an amendment in a person's own life. So we'll be reading as some of these messages, and you'll see exactly how that's stated then. And the other thing that was of very extreme importance on a supremacy level where the Blessed Mother spoke is about the importance of the priesthood and the Eucharist. On a continual basis, the girl spoke about how she always talked about the Eucharist and, and the importance of the priesthood. So again, nothing too radical there. What were the messages given? It is heavens intervening into the affairs of mankind at this stage of civilization, lest all innocence be lost. If anybody has looked at the last generation, pick a number 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you can look at the gradual spiral of decline of morals and of the corruption of the youth. And I think what these are about, why they were so direct with so much information, was specifically about innocence wouldn't be lost on a much wider basis. And that's why heaven will intervene, because all through scripture we see, and especially in the Old Testament, God always speaks to his remnant and saves his remnant. All through the entire Bible, there is a remnant 
in, uh, that stays in fidelity to the faith. So what was the world, um, what we're really saying is that the world is speaking about a great reset. I think what Garabandal is about is a divine reset on heaven's terms. Why? Because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Now the subtitle of the book is The Warning and the Great Miracle, but it's, it, as I say, it's the divine reset that will correct the conscience of the world. What we're looking at is, a, is an intervention for a divine reset because we're so collectively lost, it's gonna take an act of God right like this to show man the state of their own souls. So my methodology in doing the book, I first learned about Garabandal in 1984 from a family friend of a man that I met at church who um, had known Joey Lomangino's family quite well. And so I had, as soon as I heard about it, I saw how it could possibly fit into all of the dynamics of what was happening in the world, economically, socially, politically, tech technocracy and everything else. It just seemed to fit how God would move in a time like this in an extreme act of grace for a culture that has gone very, very off course. So in my methodology was for the book, I didn't mix and match other apparition sites. It was a design by, from the very, very beginning, there was no end, no beginning to matching other apparition sites of what was said here. And if you really look at the data, you'll see exactly how, when you see what was said there, how it could match another apparition. But I wanted to ma uh, match an apple to an apple, not an apple to a peach or a plum or anything else. Garabindal has to stand on its own legs and, and not be validated by anything else because when the church investigates an apparition, it doesn't go, let's say, what happened at Akita or Guadalupe or Fatima or anything else. It has to stand on its own for the integrity of the messages. So uh, in 1995, I spent a half day with Malachi Martin in his apartment in New York. And he said something to me that day that has stuck with me to this very, very day of why I'm not a guesser of what events will be. I merely present the data, I, I present the pro and the con, the different sides of the diamond, the different facets of what things could be presenting data. But I let the reader make their own conclusion. And Malachi Martin said, he said when an apper, now he was an old man here, and uh, he died several years later after having heart surgery. But um, he said, what the way, an uh, the way a prophecy is written, it will happen exactly as it was written, but not the way you think. And I found that to be true. And it's one of the reasons I I I'm, I'm anathema to beginning to predict dates. Why? Because every single person in the 40 years that I've been reading about this general subject, when somebody predicts a date specifically outside of the Blessed Mother saying it versus maybe another locutionist or apparition site that you're really not sure of, where the church or people haven't really laid hands on it and it's been investigated thoroughly by a commission, honestly, that what happens is, uh, those people tend to generally go up in flames. I haven't seen it missed to this very day. And what a lot of people do is they move the goalposts. As soon as they miss, they move the goalposts and say it's out further. And I, I can't think of a symbol, single example t right here today where that hasn't been true. And we know all the way around the year 2000, people started guessing as as prior to the Jubilee of the year 2000, it was the year of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father, and every single person was making prognostications on what would happen with Garabandal. And guess what? Here we are 24 years later, and the events haven't come into fruition. But <clears throat> when I saw what the church, and you know, I've known the prophecies, I, my first trip there was 1994, and then again in 2017, and then, um, you could see th things moving clear in that direction. And so when I saw that the, there was going to be a synod, which started out as a two-year 
process now. It's to, it ends in October of 2024. And then the desire specifically of a pope going to Moscow, which were both prophecies, you could see things coming clear into focus. It wasn't hard to see that at all at that point. So these are very, very emotional, uh, very power-packed messages that I have never seen in my adult life ever anywhere where such detail is given specifically about specific events to happen. So, as I said, I, I haven't guessed this, and we won't perceive them, but there's been this parlor game of guessing the date specifically for the miracle. And, you know, is it, and we'll get into some of that. But, you know, when, when the Hebrew people left Egypt, how many of, after they had already seen 10 miracles happen with Moses, how many people thought they'd be walking through the Red Sea parting? You know, it, it, it just wasn't in their mind. And then at Fatima, how many people on a promised miracle, uh, which nobody knew what it was, how many people would ever think that 70,000 people would witness the miracle of the sun? Guess what? Neither of those had ever happened before. And so what, that's exactly what was said here. We're on new turf, new ground, new thinking, new events that have never happened ever before. And we will hopefully get into have time for some of that. Now, Garabandal, there's no doubt whatsoever, is, has very sensational prophecies, none whatsoever. I, it, there has been hysteria in the past with people prognosticating the events that have missed. And I think as these months and years maybe go on, it's still going to continue and will probably build up. So we can see that, um, you know, if something doesn't happen, so let's say specifically after a synod where it was said Russia would overrun Europe, or as it said, a, a free part of the world, um, if it doesn't happen immediately, people will say it's false. But we can't, we don't know the time frame. And heaven moves specifically when they will move at the proper time. So I, I treat the three events, which if the people are here, they probably have a general knowledge of the warning, the miracle, and the permanent sign. I'm a little bit different. I treat those as almost like three acts in the same play. A lot of people that write about Garabandal say, before the warning, this has to happen. Immediately after the warning, that has to happen. There is an element of truth in that for some things because that's what the girl said. But I, you know, if you, in every single uh, play, there, let's say it's three acts, you'll have um, certain events happen in an act, but it all comes together at the end. And because these events may be so close, which we'll get into, um, it's very hard to say exactly what will happen when. And let's take the example of we know communism will be very much rampant throughout the world. Well, that's already in process, so it's not like it's going to happen after an event. We've been generations right now with many big countries, and the United States is going more and more anti-God, so we're seeing elements of that already here. So these are generational occurrences. Now, on drawing conclusions, I don't um, say what will happen in my approach. I merely present the data, and then I let the reader make their own conclusions. As Father, Father said early on, Garabandal has had seven bishops since 1961, and none have condemned it. We know there's the three stages um, uh, of status in the church of general acceptance, like Fatima, Lords, Guadalupe, et cetera. Um, and then we have a flat out condemnation like others. But this is, this is an element where the church has never approved or disapproved it. It has never been condemned. And that's very, very significant with all seven bishops take since 1961 when the apparitions began. No bishop has said it's, it's not supernatural. They've left it in that middle stage of let's wait. It's in the position of the church waiting on the fulfillment of the prophecies. That, in, in my opinion, that's very, very prudent of the church. 
Uh, this is the wisdom of the church for the protection of the faithful and very, very prudent. Let's wait to see what happened. Let's not get ahead of our skis here. Let's wait to see what happens. Why? Because when the church waits and gives a judgment, it's been thorough investigation. This is where the church is very good. They always don't investigate as they should with commissions, but on the other hand, waiting protects the faithful to where somebody can say, well, look what happened at that apparition site, and the church said yes, when it was actually false. So in 2012, the Bishop of Santander, which is the, uh, the Diocese of Garabandal, uh, a bishop celebrated mass there. So the church faithful are waiting on approval in joyful hope. So with that, as a longer introduction than may be necessary, let's look at some of the messages briefly. And this, I would say, is the equivalent of like a PowerPoint of major messages. So if for those maybe not as familiar, in June 1961, the Archangel Michael appears to all four girls, Conchita, Jacinta, Mary Lowley, and Mary Cruz. Three were 12, Mary Cruz was 11. On July 1st, St. Michael announces Our Lady would appear as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. On July 2, the Feast of the Visitation in today's calendar, but the Feast of the Ark of the Covenant in the old calendar, she came for the first time. Now, um, what we can see, we know that the Blessed Mother is the Ark of the New Covenant. And when Moses actually was with the Ark of the Covenant, he never lost a battle. So I read that the Blessed Mother's coming for battle and she sees where the culture is. Now there's two major messages, which I call the bookends, er, very early, and, and um, because she came July 2, and she gave a very major message on October 18, 1961. And uh, I call these two the bookends, and I'll read them. She said on October 18th, many sacrifices must be made, many penances must be done. We must make many visits to the Blessed Sacrament, but first of all, we must be good. If we do not do this, punishment awaits us. Already the cup is filling. And if, there's a key word, the conditional if. If we do not change, we will be punished. So we can see there's a condition there, which is in the Old Testament I call the if-then clause. If my people do this then. And we can see many, many times in the Old Testament where if the Hebrew people as God's chosen race, if they didn't do what they were told, in essence, they got a divine spanking. You know, and, and the worse that got all the way to pagan idolatry, the, the uh, severity of punishments increased. So that's heaven's way. So then, so we see that in June 18, 1965, this is a real zinger and it bothers a lot of people. So uh, she said, as my message of October 18th, meaning 1961, has not been complied with and has been made known to the world, I am advising you that this is the last one. Before the cup was filling, now it is flowing over. Many cardinals, many bishops, and many priests are on the road to perdition and are taking many souls with them. Less and less importance is being given to the Eucharist. So, you know, again, she's very, very direct here on, on her interpretation of what's happening in the church. But again, here's the last major message she spoke about, people are not spending enough time with the Eucharist. She said, you should turn uh, the wrath of God away from yourselves by your efforts. If you ask his forgiveness with sincere hearts, he will pardon you. I, your mother, through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel, ask you to amend your lives. Again, amendment is all throughout these. You are now receiving the last warning. I love you very much and do not want your condemnation. Pray to us with sincerity and we will grant your request. You should make more sacrifices. Think about the passion of Jesus. Now, there were two significant messages that very people are familiar with that follow Garabandal, and they're called the Night of Screams. They were two nights, the Nights of Screams. The first one uh, was on um, uh, June 19, 1962, where Jacinta and Mary Lowley saw visions where Russia would have dominion over the world. Notice how emotive and descriptive what's coming up here. 
Russia, Russia would have dominion over the world. It didn't say the USSR or the, or the republics as we know them today. And communism would rule Europe. Priests would go into hiding. Churches would be destroyed and there would be many martyrs. Now we have to separate ourselves a little bit from that message in the West and maybe the United States in particular, but there are many, many places in the world where uh, freedom of worship is not accepted right now in many churches uh, uh, in, in different nations. We can see persecution, Nigeria being one where, where clergy is being slaughtered all over Nigeria. And so um, in the West, we may not see that as much or in the United States, but in many nations of the world, this is true. So uh, the Blessed Mother is speaking to the whole world here. She's not specifically speaking to Stockbridge, Massachusetts and environs. And that's a mistake that a lot of people make when they try to interpret apparitions. They look at their own locale. We're a nation, we're a world of approximately 7.5 billion people where a great percentage of the world is on subsistence living or literally near starvation. So it's a big world and it's not just where we live and what we see. The girls were shown in a vision that rivers would turn red with blood, the church would be persecuted and decimated. Its buildings will no longer exist as they once did. Professing your faith will be difficult and the sacraments would be difficult to receive. The girls were heard crying out, stop telling us those things. Wait, wait, everyone should confess. They should get ready. When it appears all is lost, the warning would come. So there's a little bit of a clue in the time frame when it appears all is lost. So we see these little things that add up cumulatively to coming to some sort of conclusion where data is given. Their tear-stained faces and incoherent speech immediately afterwards attested to the trauma experienced by Jacinta, Mary Lowley, and Mary Cruz during the first night of screams. For some, details of what they experienced were not divulged. Over time, details did emerge. And that's very uh, common in apparitions where what was said initially wasn't as uh, descriptive of the totality macro package there, but uh, details many times do emerge. And for people who study apparitions, they see that. Because she said the chastisement will come soon if the world continues the same. Now, the second night of screams was the night after on June 20th, 1962, on the vigil of Corpus Christi, there was another horrifying vision that lasted for three and a half hours. The girls saw destructive things happening in the world at a future time. Mary Lowley Mazan, who she became Mary Lowley Lafleur from Haverhill, Massachusetts, which I'm sure many of you know, um, said, we saw rivers change into blood, fire fell from the sky, and something worse still, which I'm not able to reveal now. Three of the girls were shown the great chastisement of fire that would come if humanity reverts to its evil ways after the grace of the great miracle. So it's a little bit of the condition there. The girls were heard saying, oh, don't let this happen. Don't let this come. May everyone go to confession first. The girls wept. Don't let this happen. Don't let this come. Forgive us. Don't let this happen. And as it turns out, after the second night of screams, the entire village did go to confession the next day, you know. So um, Jacinta and Mary Lowley said, the Virgin has told us that if the world continues the same and it has not changed at all, few will see God. So few they are that it is causing the Virgin great sorrow. How unfortunate that the world does not change. The Virgin has told us that the chastisement is coming. As the world is not changing, the cup is filling up. And we're gonna talk about a very critical part of what the cup filling up is. And I'll tell you what it was, is the scourge of abortion would come to the world. And she said that, and never, but never used the word abortion, but it's interesting language how the message was given to Conchita. Her sorrowful is the, how sorrowful is the virgin, although she does not allow us to see it. Since the virgin loves us so much, she suffers alone, since she is so good. Everyone be good so that the virgin will be happy. She has told us that those who are good should pray for those who are evil. Yes, we should pray to God for the world. For those who do not know him, be good, be very good. Now here's what was said specifically about an unborn child. 
Conchita spoke quite openly about the developments by which men in the near future would rebel against God. Now, I mind you, this is a, now at this point, is a 13-year-old girl living in a mountain village in um, northern Spain where there wasn't a motor with a moving parts. That's how simple this was. And so on the day after Our Lady's last appearance at Garabandal, Conchita asked how someone can kill a child without killing the mother. She was asked, now what gave you that idea, someone asked. Conchita, well, the Blessed Mother spoke about this and she let me know that this will happen with the overflowing of the chalice. Now remember you, the first major uh, message was the cup is filling up. Now the chalice is flowing over in 1965. So we see that they know that abortion is going to grow. It is beginning to uh, gain a head of steam legislatively and throughout the world. And to this very day, what we see this battle still is. Um, in the second message of June 18, 65, the Virgin said, before the cup was filling up, now it is flowing over. There is your answer, abortion. Conchita said this trembling without being able to visualize what it really implied. She said it disturbed her so very much that she felt ridiculous because she didn't understand how, at all how this could happen. The Blessed Virgin had not explained it to her, and up until that moment, nobody had been explained to her at all. Now, there's, as we said, there's three major events. There's the warning, the miracle, and, and, and uh, the permanent sign that we know will happen. So Mary Lowley was often asked, since you are not allowed to tell me the exact year of the warning, Perhaps you could tell me approximately when it will happen. Lowly would respond, it will be at a time when the world will be most in need of it. Lowly continued, when Russia will suddenly and unexpectedly overrun a great part of the free world. God does not want this to happen so quickly. In any case, the warning will come when you will see the holy mass cannot be celebrated freely anymore then it will be at the time the world will most need the intervention of God. So in essence, things get to such a state, we're not gonna make it as a world unless we can see this divine intervention. That's this ultimate act of grace. As I said, this is now the mother load and it being in the mothership of mercy here and how appropriate to see this act. This is an extreme act of mercy for humanity. Now, you know, uh, there's been some prophecies of where Conchita was asked, would, um, would there be a third world war? And she said no. Now, if you look at that, she was asked that in October of 1962, which was the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where boats were underway, uh, Soviet warships were underway going to Cuba, and we knew the world was right on the brink. President Kennedy was on TV. Uh, Children in school were actually, you know, taught to go underneath a desk and, and put their, their, their hands over the back of their neck and kneel. This man's, you know, you were young enough to remember that, nodding in the front. And so uh, this is what was going on. So when Conchita was asked, would there be a third war? I think the context of that question was the Cuban Missile Crisis and potential war with the United States, of how close we came with both nations having nuclear capability then. So um, it's been alleged that, you know, uh, that people have br tried to bring that to perpetuity. I'm not one of them that says that war is perpetuity. So let's even look briefly at what's going on right now in the Ukraine. We have, in the Ukraine, the United States has pledged God knows how many tens of billions because of black ops, off balance sheet uh, counting, and what is going there. We know Abrams tanks, we know the um, uh, Ukrainians are training on uh, our fighter jets. We know that we're sending Abram tanks a generation, several generations behind, beyond what's already there. We have China. Uh, we have Russia and the United States as the three superpowers very, very engaged in what's happening there. So, and then we have intel from the Islamic world. We have money from the Islamic world, drone technology from Iran um, going to Russia. We have NATO, which has 31 nations. The last member to be admitted was Finland. And Finland, as a country, has an 800-mile border. That's almost from here to literally Illinois. 
um, an 800-mile border uh, with the Soviet Union. And we have 31 nations in NATO alone to where just recently 54 billion euros on top of what's already been given has, has been pledged to Ukraine for the war. So if this isn't a world war, what is? You know, uh, the Vietnam War all the way through the end of it by government was called a conflict. Yet we had 50,000 American soldiers die, and we had hundreds of thousand North and South Vietnamese. So you'd have to decide for yourself what's a war and what's a conflict, and what constitutes before it's called a war, because a lot of governments don't like to declare it, but yet they do it. So um, that's just an awful lot of money. So for me, the context of that was literally the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there's disagreement. There's some very, very good people that are very much friends of Garabandal that put that out to perpetuity. As I said, I'm not one of them. And so the Blessed Mother once told Conchita, it would be like an invasion of communism. The girls described the time, the time of tribulation as the return of communism. Now in political philosophy, it's very, very important to understand that communism, there's a lot of ism, socialism, fascism, communism, uh, all sorts of isms. And uh, communism can be, in, in definition, is a world that God is not permitted in the culture or government. It doesn't necessarily have to be violent, but usually is. Now, I'd ask this, in 1962 and 1963, we removed um, uh, the Bible and the prayer out of the classroom by order of the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS. Supreme Court wouldn't allow it there. Now, I spent two years in Poland and I spent two years in Belarus. I had an office and an apartment in both of them for four years. And I can tell you, removing prayer and um, the Bible from the classroom is a communist act. That's what that is. We have to change the narrative. We're right now like the frog in the water boiling to death. We don't even know what's going on anymore because of the normalcy bias. There's so much going on around us that's so negative and culturally perverse. We pretty much accept it now because we have to see it or we have to be around it because it's our culture. We can't avoid it. But we are moving legislatively and administratively to not socialism, but to communism, a world without God. And in the United States, we have a lot of politicians paying lip service to you know, uh, socialist doctrine, which the head of the Socialist Party in the 1930s himself, and you can find this on the net, you can find, uh, it, it, you, all you gotta do is look it up. He said, we can't use the word socialist because the American people find it abhorrent. So they come up with the word progressive and liberal to change the narrative on their terms. The key is to change the narrative for the left on a language that they determine they want to use and you respond to it. And that's what our culture has been fighting now for many, many, many years. And the right, by and large, rather than being very, very forceful, is just responding to this heinous culture in the left. So the warning begins, according to Con uh, Conchita, as a sighting in the sky but not a comet, meteor, or anything of a physical nature, since it will be supernatural. Now, this is not very important. It will not be explained by science. You can't explain by science the, the sun hurtling to the earth at, the fa at Fatima, and you cannot explain by science the Red Sea rising up with people walk, which, which amounted to two million people, inclu including the rabble, marching through the Red Sea on dry ground. You can't explain that by science. It's a mystical, supernatural event. And these things here will not be explained by science. That's very important to understand, to understand the overall dynamic of this. And she said, the warning will be brought about the church will have something like a schism, something. The warning will happen after the chastisement has run its course. Now, we only, we, I've got to really be very, very quick here, and I can't get into any of the stories, but just what was said here because of time. Now, to get to the miracle, what is the reason for the warning? The reason, the primary reason for the warning is to correct the conscience of the world, thus this title, to, co re, uh, to correct the conscience of the world, subtitle. The second reason is to put a stop to the global advancement of atheistic communism. Now, the miracle 
is, has more information than the warning. We only know the year of the warning and basically it'll be an illumination of, of, of conscience and a, a judgment in miniature, a viso in Spanish, a warning where we will see the state of our soul as God would judge it. We will see sins of omission, commission, what um, the sins that we did earlier that led to much more grievous sins because sin is longitudinal and has a history. As I always say, if it's, if it's hysterical, it's historical. So um, there's a reason for aberrant behavior and by and large sin has a lot to do with it. So for the miracle, a miracle is for the conversion of the whole world. This assertion was made by our Lord himself to Conchita at Garabandal. It will coincide with an event in the church. In, uh, on October 1st, 1961, Our Lady of Mount Carmel at Garabandal told something very important to Conchita. She said it had to do with a future major church event where there would be, quote, a reunification of the Christians. A reunification means there was a split. There's a reuniting. And the two great events is the East and the West in 1054, and the other was the Protestant Revolution now 507 years ago and the East and the West split in 1054. And we know that John, one of the goals of the stated goals of John Paul II was his goal was to have the church breathe again with two lungs, meaning the East and the West. So this description of a great event in the church is a poor, poor translation of the original spoken by Conchita. It is incorrect to translate the phrase as a great event as we see so much in the narrative. And, but the actual phrase was, in, in, in a Spanish word, a particular event in the church or a specific event in the church. And frankly, we don't know what that is. A lot of speculation, who knows? The miracle is not only for the conversion of Russia, but for the conversion of the whole world. Thus, as the Blessed Mother said, all will love our hearts. Um, the statement was made by our Lord to Conchita at Garabandal, that all would love our hearts. It will be the, the, the definite article, the, the greatest miracle ever performed by Jesus for the world. It is supernatural and has never been seen before and will not be explained by science. Padre Pio saw the miracle. He did see it before he died. There's a great deal in the book specifically about Padre Pio's um, dialogue, meeting, and, and interest in Garabandal. And it's very, very clear, even in his own handwriting. The reigning pope will see the great miracle from wherever he is. Before the miracle, something will happen that will cause people to stop believing in Garabandal. The miracle will occur on a Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Spanish time. It will happen between the, the dates of the 8th and the 16th, inclusive of those dates, of March, April, May, or June. Now, if anybody is look, looking on the net or reading, there is more information on that with predictions than any one other thing. April, May, but I, I, uh, from an, a VHS tape that I saw 25 years ago, Conchita is on. Uh, Irish TV being interviewed, and she literally said March, April, May, or June. But everybody's got an opinion on that, and I, I get that. According to Mary Lowley, the miracle will take place within one year after the warning. Now, there's all sorts of other people predicting shorter spans of time, but what was said at Garabandal to where, so we can measure an apple to an apple, not an apple to you know, a coconut or anything else. She specifically said within one year, we'll see the miracle after the warning. It will be on the feast day of a young Eucharistic martyr. It will last about 15 minutes. It will be seen in the sky. It will be possible to photograph and televise, but not touch it. All those in the village and in the surrounding areas, mountains will see it. Now, anybody who's been there, Garabandal is a natural amphitheater. You, if, as you look down on it, millions could actually sit there in a stadium-like seating, and it would be very, very comfortable. It, you wouldn't be on uh, a degree slope where you found it uncomfortable. And so heaven has this, as I always say, heaven finesses things always well in advance with all of the details to see the fulfillment of a prophecy. And only when you study it do you see it in retrospect. But the problem is, due to our, our culture today, 
and everybody with an internet connection at two in the morning with insomnia, frankly, puts out an opinion that isn't really researched, and then people are quoting it. And that's why you have to go back to kind of a lot of the original documents there. Now, here's the one I love best of, that will validate Garabandal. It was said, the sick who are present will be cured. Think of that. Think how profound that is. You have a loved one. You have somebody with a very serious illness, wheelchair, whatever it may be, a disease that's incurable. The promise there is every single person who will journey to Garabandal will be healed. And it's interesting, when Mother Angelica, after being in metal leg braces for 42 years, the one place in the world that she went, we all know she was devoted to the infant of Prague, um, and other, other apparition sites and devotions of the church, but the one place she went for Thanksgiving was Garabandal. We know John Paul II was very much in favor. He, he in, made an inscription to a book on it. Paul VI was very emphatic, and I have some of the things he said here about it, uh, of, of things that he said. We know um, Mother Teresa and, and others were very in favor of it. Russia will be converted after the miracle. Conchita, who knows the day of the great miracle, will announce it to the world eight days in advance. Before the miracle, many will stop believing in Garabandal. On the day after the miracle, the body of, of Father Louis Andreu, SJ, will be removed from his grave and found incorrupt. Now, he has already been found corrupt, which is very interesting, but, you know, uh, Conchita was, was brought that to Conchita's attention and, and she made an interesting comment. She said, well, it's not the day of the miracle yet, <laughs> you know. So the miracle, and also this is one that I don't fully understand. The miracle will be Euchar Eucharistic and Marian. So we, we know that um, there are elements that are very, very specific. I can't think of any prophecy in history that has given so much detail in advance. And this thing is either gonna be very, very, very true, or this is gonna go up in flames like no other. You know, we know uh, in terms of where the church is, we know that fa a young Father Ratzinger, who then became Cardinal Ratzinger, head of the CDF, and then Benedict XV, over 45 plus years, used to write about a, a fourth century theologian by the name of Tychonius, who I, I find this absolutely fascinating as we look at our church and culture today. And if you Google Tychonius, you'll see what was said here. But the question was, do the faithful leave the church or does the church leave the faithful? Pope Benedict was fascinated by this and just several years before he died, he even wrote more on Tychonius. Benedict wrote, Tychonius understands that the great falling away or the great apostasy of the end times will not be caused by unfaithful people leaving the bride of Christ, have to listen carefully to this, will not, by unfaithful people leaving the bride of Christ, but rather by the bride of Christ pulling away from those within her who are unfaithful. In other words, for Tychonius, it is not the infidels who will fall away, but rather the true believers who will withdraw from the evil within the church. Whoa. Oh, so here you have a pope, cardinal. You know, the head of the, to be head of the CDF is a very, very important position in the church. And he had an absolute fascination. And we know if you would also Google Benedict and what he wrote about the state of the church, of where it would be, he talked about how the church it's, a, it, it's several paragraphs that the church would lose a lot of its possessions that had taken centuries to gain um, and build up, and it would be a destitute church, in essence. And so that's where he's kind of getting this. So again, there has been no condemnation or approval of the messages, and, um, and that's where I have to cut it off, because that clock is telling me it's time to go. <laughs> Absolutely, you're the boss here. I'm scripted here, and I'm following it. Um, the permanent sign is what, what be, could be act three in the play. 
that after the great miracle is a permanent sign. We don't know what it is. There's, very, there's no description of what it way, may be. There isn't the degree of detail specifically of the great miracle. You know, think of it, 8.30 p.m. Spanish time between the 8th and the 16th. I mean, can you get more specific for, frankly, a wayward people uh, as a grace to help people out here? Okay, so there's not a lot of thinking if you follow this and believe it. But the permanent sign will be left at the Nine Pines, um, and we frankly don't know what it is. A tremendous amount of speculation. Everybody probably here has an opinion on it based upon who they read. But again, my methodology was not to mix and match. Thank you. Thank you. The, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you there. Thank you very much. So we'll just finish up now, everybody. Father Mark is, Brother Mark is going to ramp down. But if I could say one last thing before we end, as Ted pointed out, this is uh, an apparition that the church has not condemned. That's why we're talking about it. We are not promoting it. You all know the rule of Marian apparitions, even approved, you are not required to believe them as Catholics, but the message is well worth noting, and we want to finish with this. This is very, very important, is Our Lady says all these chastisements are conditional. If we don't change, these things will happen. And I'd like to quote Ted's book to finish. A formal approval of, the, of Garam Bandal, either by the local bishop or Rome, would not appear likely until we have had the great miracle which precisely was promised by heaven to authenticate this most unusual and fascinating series of happenings that God has provided for his church in crisis. So in other words, it seems very likely that the reason it's not been determined fully approved is it's not finished in that sense. It's not done. And so we have to find out and wait, as Ted said. Am I, as the provincial, promoting this? No. Am I, as the provincial, saying the Marians have to spread this around the world? No. What am I saying? That the message of Mary is consistent everywhere else she has appeared in approved apparitions. That is, stop offending God. Turn back to him. Stop sinning. Pray. Do penance. Do sacrifice. Our church needs it now more than ever. And guess what? Our Lady taught these children the most important to pray the rosary, and that's what we're about to do right now. So Brother Mark is going to ramp down. Join us back up on the next video here in a few minutes. All of us in attendance, remain with us if you can, because we're going to begin the first Saturday devotions, which includes all that Mary asked at Fatima, praying the rosary, and meditating on the mysteries. God bless you, and we'll be right back.